Thank you. Okay, yes, it's working. So I also would like to thank the organizer for the invitation to talk here. It's always a pleasure to be back in Trieste. And I will uh, talk about Gravitino and Decaying Dark Matter at LHC. In this work based on collaboration with many people. You see them written here, Giorgio Arcadi, Federico Dradi, Marco Nardecchia, Alexandra Albrey, Marco Battaglia, Jasper Asenkamp, and uh, Fazila Mahmoudi. So I will try to cover everything. It's a little bit, um, well, a lot of material. We'll see how much I uh, get through. So I will uh, start to give us a few short introduction, trying to convince you that uh, apart from the WIMP mechanism, there is also other mechanism which can produce the dark matter in the right abundance. And they can give you also uh, a rise to an interesting phenomenology. And then I will go and discuss two scenarios of this kind. One is connected to the Gravitino. The Gravitino, of course, has a kind of uh, in, uh, well, uh, a very interesting and uh, very special role in uh, theories uh, with supersymmetry, since it is the gauge fermion of uh, supergravity. And it is, in some sense, a particle which uh, uh, has also characteristics which are just uh, <laughs> determined by the symmetry. And uh, so it is, in some sense, uh, one, I think, of the uh, supersymmetric particle which is uh, really very interesting to uh, explore. And I will discuss here uh, different scenarios of Gravitino dark matter and their phenomenology at the LHC. In particular, in the case of a stop and LSP, what happens instead if you have a neutralino and LSP in the PMSSM? And then if I have time, a short connection to the case of baryogenesis in the case of Gravitino dark matter. And then in the last part, I will instead move to a scenario which is not supersymmetric, but, and it's a very simple scenario which we uh, wrote down in some sense to try to capture the basic ingredients of this uh, connection of FIMP and super WIMP without having a full model, if you want, a full ultraviolet uh, complete model. Uh, the characteristic of this model is that you have very minimal set of parameters and you can nevertheless also explain the dark matter density and have also interesting uh, phenomenology. Okay, so let me start with this introduction and try to convince you, indeed, that we have actually something more interesting or as, at least as interesting as the WIMP to study. And this is uh, practically the idea of the super WIMP or the FIMP paradigms. Uh, and the idea here is, in some sense, to try to produce the dark matter, not from thermal equilibrium, but from a particle which used to be or was in thermal equilibrium. So the classical picture is that you have a WIMP, and the simplest scenarios are where you just add a small decay channel of the WIMP into some other particle. And the WIMP, of course, can decay into this particle where, while it is still in equilibrium, so in this uh, period. And at the same time, it will decay then eventually after it freezes out. And in these two uh, very different epochs, it will at the same time produce the particle, the daughter particle in the decay. And uh, these mechanisms are usually called FIMP in this uh, equilibrium regime and super WIMP in the uh, final regime. Notice that in this case, these two uh, mechanisms in some sense are both present if you have a particular decay channel. And the characteristic to be uh, in some sense uh, very, um, well, uh, they are effective, especially if you have very small couplings uh, so that the decay time is actually very long. And we will see, therefore, also later that this is usually connected to a particle with a long lifetime. Now, uh, what, uh, which one of these two mechanisms actually dominates in the production of dark matter depends on the parameters. Here, for example, uh, we are changing the mass of the a heavy field which decays. And this, as you see, depending on the mass, you could have either the super wind contribution dominating or the, or the FIMP contribution dominating. And in some sense, both of them can actually give rise to the right density to have a dark matter, uh, the right relic density for dark matter. So, um, and as I said, they are actually connected always, they can be connected to the same coupling, and therefore they are in some sense usually present at the same time in a particular model. Now, uh, what does that this have co as consequences for phenomenology? Well, of course, it has a, 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 well, it changes in some sense the WIMP connection that we are usually used to, to something like a FIMP or super WIMP connection. So in that sense there, you would have still this early universe production from a WIMP in some sense with this leakage into dark matter uh, that I just talked about. But at the same time, uh, you can use the similar diagram to get phenomenology at colliders or in indirect detection. 
At colliders, again, you can produce this uh, uh, mother particle, this uh, which I call here WIMP, and this, as I said, will actually result usually to have a, a long lifetime and therefore uh, bring uh, about uh, displaced vertices or even metastable particles at the LHC that you could try to measure and to disentangle what is this uh, decay length. On the other hand, the dark matter in these scenarios is coupling very, very weakly because this is, is actually very, very slow decay. And therefore, in general, you don't really need a symmetry to make the dark matter stable. You usually have naturally uh, dark matter particles with lifetime, which are much longer than the age of the universe. Actually, we will see later, we have lifetimes of the order of 10 to the 28 seconds. And this means that, uh, well, if you are lucky, the dark matter particle could decay actually now in our galaxy, and you could be able to uh, observe the decay products of the dark matter decay. And uh, this, in some sense, will also give you another information on, uh, of the uh, dark matter couplings to the visible sector. And in the simplified model I will talk at the end, it's actually these couplings are related, and therefore you can really also cross-check and, in some sense, try to measure all the parameters of the model. Now, uh, this uh, the decaying dark matter is actually more general, so here is just uh, the, my usual plot to show you what is the flux that you would expect from a decaying dark matter candidate. It is, of course, proportional to the density instead of the density square, and the decay rate depends, of course, on the, uh, on the, uh, the lifetime of the particle. Notice here, the, again, the spectrum. The spectrum, in some sense, it can be the same spectrum you would expect also for annihilation. And in particular, you could also have lines, and we will get perhaps to that at the end. And if you have lines, the advantage, of course, is that it's a very uh, smoking gun signature on one point. And secondly, the position of the line will tell you immediately what is the mass of the dark matter. So let me go now to the case of the Gravitino. The Gravitino, of course, has a long history, and it has been studied in cosmology since many, many, many years. And the uh, usual uh, thing is actually that is very famous is the so-called Gravitino problem. And the Gravitino problem, uh, well, I will actually talk to it in, in the next slide. But the point is that usually the Gravitinos, if it is not stable, it is very long-lived, and this can cause troubles in cosmology. But assuming it is stable, the densities of Gravitinos can be set both by uh, equilibrium uh, computation. So in the case of uh, the equilibrium density, you get that the, the Gravitino couples are usually very weakly, and the couples when it is still relativistic, so that it has actually the right uh, density at the corresponding to masses which are very small, and therefore it's usually a warm or even hot dark matter, which is now more or less excluded. And this one was discussed in the 80s already. It was actually, I think, the first uh, supersymmetric dark matter candidate discussed. And of course, so this scenario is actually nowadays not the best scenario from structure formation. And therefore, we will concentrate on the second scenario where you have the gravitinos never in thermal equilibrium, but you produce them slowly, both through this FIMP and super wind mechanism I discussed above, before. But actually, in the case of the gravitino, you also have dimension five scatterings, which gives you also a contribution which is proportional to the heat temperature. And depending on the height, uh, how large the heat temperature is, this is actually very often the dominant contribution. If you see here, this is, uh, for example, in this case, the uh, one part of the contribution is coming from the geginos. So here you have a dependence on the geigino masses, square, and inversely proportional to the gravitino mass. And this will be important later on uh, in, the, in the discussion. So uh, through this uh, production, you see that if you have reheating temperature sufficiently large, you can produce, in some sense, the right number densities for masses of the superpartners in the GV, TV uh, range. Now, the problems I was talking about is actually here. It's the, the fact that if the gravitino is not stable or not very, very long-lived, as we will discuss later, if you just, it is not the LSP, uh, then it can decay into other supersymmetric particles with a lifetime which is long. It is, in, it is of the order of 10 to the 7 seconds, for example, but not long enough. So 10 to the 7 seconds is actually after nucleosynthesis, and, uh, well, it's approximately one year if you want uh, to translate that. 
And um, it, if uh, you have a, a large population of gravitino decaying after nucleosynthesis, this can actually destroy uh, the abundances of light elements and uh, well, destroy the predictions of nucleosynthesis. And uh, from this plot, you can see some of the limits you can pose in the scenario, depending in this case, again, on the reheating temperature, exactly because the density is here assumed to be proportional to the reheating temperature. And you, it uh, turns out that uh, if you want to be completely safe, you have to really have a very heavy gravitino above uh, something like 40 TeV. Or otherwise, uh, you have to live with a small reheat temperature of the order of 10 to the 5 or lower. So in that sense, uh, these uh, changes, if you want the cosmology, the presence of uh, gravitino, uh, which is um, not the, uh, the LSP. Uh, in the scenario I will discuss, instead, I will take the gravitino to be the LSP, and I will then have the limits on BBN not on the LSP, which is in some sense either stable or sufficiently stable not to decay during nucleosynthesis, but uh, on the uh, NLSP. And this NLSP will be, in this case, for example, in the first study, actually the stop. We will take the stop as the NLSP uh, for two reasons. One, of course, uh, it is the fact uh, that you have uh, naturally a very low density of stops in the early universe because it's a particle which interacts uh, strongly. And therefore, you are hoping that the limits on BBN nucleosynthesis are actually weaker because you have a low density. On the other hand, uh, you have also, you know, probably all know, for naturality reasons, a light stop is actually preferred by the, uh, to, in order to have a light Higgs. So um, in this case, of course, um, it will be the lightest stop. The, the other one can be much heavier. Now, in this scenario, we have looked at the uh, BBN constraints. And uh, there are still a region which is excluded by BBN, also for the case of stop. Even if the density is very low, you have actually bound state effects which cause actually a change in the abundances of light elements. And therefore, you see the regions here above is actually excluded because the lifetime of the stop would be too long. Uh, it's uh, of the order of 100 seconds or so. On the other hand, if you want to have the right density of uh, gravitinos, you have actually to be uh, more or less on this line, depending on the reheat temperature. So in this plot, I'm taking something like 10 to the 7 GeV. And you see, therefore, that you have just the white region where uh, if you are on the uh, yellow line, you are exactly at the right density. And in the white region, you would be below uh, the, the density. But of course, changing the heat temperature, you can move the yellow line about in this plane. And of course, lower heat temperature would move the line down and allow you to have also lower gravitino masses, which are in the other axis. But in general, at a certain point, this yellow line will cross in the, uh, in the um, practically um, red region here. And uh, this one is actually telling you the uh, maximal reheat temperature you can actually have. And uh, this is plotted here. As you see, you are in the range of 10 to the 7 uh, GV or so uh, before you really hit the BBN constraints, also for a, a stop NLSP. Notice that these bounds are actually avoided if you just switch on a small variation of R parity. And this is also the other scenario we'll discuss. This was observed uh, a few years ago. So if you have a small violation of R parity, actually in the COVID couplings in the region between 10 to the minus 12 and 10 to the minus 6, you are actually in a region which cosmologically is very favorable because on one hand, you can avoid this BBN constraints because the NLSP decays before nucleosynthesis. On the other hand, uh, if the coupling is sufficiently uh, small, you don't uh, uh, practically increase the washout processes, which would, for example, erase the lepton number or the baryon number, depending on which is the, in some sense, uh, the mechanism you choose for biogenesis. Uh, if you do it, of course, at a higher temperature and you have still washout processes active, you would actually erase uh, this uh, baryon asymmetry. So you see that you have small couplings, but uh, not incredibly small. And in this case, of course, you would have that the NLSP would not decay into the gravitino, but would decay preferentially through R parity violation. So, um, well, of course, if you have a decay at R parity breaking, not only the NLSP decays, but also the gravitino decays. But luckily, the decay is uh, suppressed by the small R parity violating coupling and by the Planck scale. And therefore, actually, you get very, very long lifetime. And uh, there are already bounds, uh, in particular from antiproton, which I'm showing here. This is one of the recent bounds, but given by De La Haye and Grefe a couple of years ago. 
from the antiprotons, and you see that this is the bound uh, which constrains actually this R parity violating parameter to be of the order of 10 to the minus 9 or so. At lower masses, here's a large gravitino mass. At lower masses, the Fermi constraints take over, and they are of the similar order of magnitude. So this means, again, that this R parity violating parameter has to be small. OK, so in general, then, we have to study the two scenarios. We can actually study two scenarios at the same time. One scenario where you have conservation of R parity, and then this NLSP would decay in gravitino and uh, top. And uh, you see here the lifetime, which is quite long, 19 seconds for this uh, parameter chosen. But of course, we have also the other choice to have a small R parity violation. In this case, the decay of the, um, of the stop will be in bottom and a charge lepton. And the DDK is a little bit smaller, so the, uh, the, if you want the lifetime, is a bit shorter, but not very short. 10 to the minus 4 for collider purposes is actually a very long lifetime. And this means that in both of these cases, you actually expect not uh, prompt decay and either displaced vertices or even metastable particles, in particular in the R party conserving more metastable particles. And this means that the usual searches which has been done, apart from the metastable particle uh, search, which ha has been already performed, do not really apply. So you have to do a dedicated analysis. And uh, this is, for example, just the picture. What we did with Federico Dradi was to try really to see where does the, this stop decay once you produce it at the LHC. So we generated the events with MATGRAPH, and we actually simulated also the decay and the decay length, and as you see, you can actually have, depending on the lifetime decays, all, all are in your possible places in your detector. In particular, we will concentrate to look at what happens if, when the decay are in the pixel or in the tracker, because there we can see the tracks more easily, and in some sense, you would see that there is a kink in the track or even a vertex. And the other thing we will also consider is the case where the decay happens really outside to the detector. And then in this case, of course, a stop, which is a charge object, could actually hadronize into a charge hadron uh, and uh, leave a track through the whole detector. So this is also a case where you could see something. And what we did here is to explore in the parameter space exactly what is the region which is accessible by the LHC searches. And uh, here is this plot. We are plotting just the mass of the stop and the lifetime of the stop. So these plots actually uh, apply to any scenario. So at the moment, we are not specifying what is the decay channel. And you see exactly uh, we are requiring practically that a sufficient number of events, uh, of decay events, either in the pixel, the tracker, or uh, how many, at least some events outside the detector. And as you see here, in the, the green line actually gives you the curve which corresponds to 10 decays outside. So above the green line, you have more than 10 decay inside the detector. Sorry, outside the detector. <laughs> Instead, the uh, red and the blue line correspond to, um, to tracker and pixel, respectively. And uh, below the line, you will have more than 10 uh, decay events, either in the pixel or in the tracker. So as you see here, if you want to cover the whole range of lifetime, you need actually to combine both searches, metastable particle and uh, pixel or tracker, uh, uh, displaced vertices. And uh, you have also a region, which is here, we will, we will uh, have it also more often later, a region where you could actually do both measurements, have both displaced vertices and uh, metastable particle. And in that region, in some sense, you would have the hope to, be, uh, to have the better lever arm to measure the parameters. Notice here in, in the, um, yellow is the region which is already excluded by the present searches on metastable particles, which, uh, of course, uh, is very effective for very long lifetime, but it runs out of steam when you have shorter lifetimes. Yeah, so this one, of course, you can interpret in both models, either in the R-parity conserving or in the R-parity evaluating model. And here it's the parameter space, in the first case, gravitino mass and uh, stop mass, in the other cases, R parity violating uh, coupling and uh, again stop mass. And you see again uh, that here, of course, in the case of the R parity conserving, as I was saying, for high reheating temperature, you are actually mostly in the metastable particle uh, or a metastable uh, signal uh, re region. In instead, in the case of the R parity violating, you have actually regions which is also only covered by the, uh, by the displaced vertices here above. 
in, the, in some sense, this is the limit from the indirect detection of dark matter, which of course depends, uh, one has to say, uh, on the mass of the dark matter, uh, so on the gravitino mass. Uh, so here we have taken one GeV, so depending on the mass, you can move it a little bit around. But for this parameter, you see immediately that there is a region where you need actually displaced vertices in order to cover the whole parameter space that you, it is available. Now, these ones are actually, uh, I will have to stress, they are for the li ultimate limit of uh, the LHC for 3,000 inverse phantobarns, so not really at the next run. Now, of course, the uh, best hope would be if you really have a displaced vertices, vertex inside the detector, especially in the tracker or in the pixel, uh, then you would also be able to see uh, the decay, uh, the tracks, and measure probably the momenta of the decay particles. The notice that in the 2D case, the visible particles are the same. It's always a bottom and, uh, well, yes. So the visible particle are always bottom and lepton, and these ones are invisible in this case, and in this case, it's just a two-body decay. So in some sense, uh, from the particle point of view, you would see the same thing in the final state, but of course, the missing energy will give you a hint, and I hope I don't have to ask you which of these two is the R-parity conserving and which is the R-parity uh, violating uh, distribution of momenta. So I think it's pretty clear. This one is actually the two-body decay, and this one instead is the four-body decay. So if you would be able to measure the momenta, you would actually be able to, really to distinguish if you are R-party conservation or R-party violation. Okay, so let me go now to the other scenario, the scenario where we studied the Gravitino in the PMSSM. This was the work done in collaboration with Arbe, uh, Battaglia, um, Hasenkamp, and Mamouri. And in this case, we wanted actually to ask especially the question, what happens if the NLSP is a neutralino? And can you really distinguish or see any differences between a neutralino dark matter and a, uh, gravitino dark matter with neutralino NLSP? So we took for the moment the uh, R parity conserving uh, PMSSM. PMSSM is a phenomenal energy MSSM with 19 parameters plus one. So this plus one is the gravitino mass in this case. And uh, we've imposed also a lot of the constraints which are already there uh, from uh, low energy also available flavors uh, and also LHC. Uh, SUSY searches and monojets. And the first thing we, uh, uh, no, you, can, you can notice immediately is actually the composition of the neutralino NLSP. The composition here is given in Hixino, Bino, and Wino, and as you see, in the case of Gravitino LSP, you don't really care what is the composition of the uh, neutralino. You have actually nearly uh, one third, one third, one third in all the three different types. Instead, if you require the, uh, the um, neutralino to be uh, really the dark matter and you want to produce the dark matter density through the WIMP mechanism, you are actually nowadays constrained to be mostly in the Hixino region. And this is just because the limit of LHC have excluded most of the Bino uh, uh, space. And so you still, you have some regions where you, have, uh, you can uh, arrange to have the right density with Bino, but the, most of the time actually you are in the Hixino region and very, very rarely in in the Wino region. So in this sense, you have really a completely different uh, composition of the neutralino in the two cases. And this, of course, gives you also uh, differences in the, what you expect. Here is one plot where we try to compare with the signals in uh, direct detection of dark matter. So in this case, it's the gravitino case. This one is the neutralino case. In this case, of course, gravitino is the dark matter. So this signal is actually not there. So even if you see points which are above the line, you shouldn't care because the gravitino uh, you cannot see in direct detection. But uh, you notice in, in the color is instead what can be excluded by LHC, at least in fraction of points. So you see that the LHC would actually uh, be very sensitive uh, to the blue point and the uh, dark blue in particular, and will exclude mostly the light, uh, if you want, NLSP mass. This instead is the case where you have really uh, imposed also a constraint that the neutralino makes up the whole dark matter. And that you see immediately in this case, you have actually that the, you, well, you have in some kind of limit of the cross uh, section. Uh, you cannot go uh, very much uh, lower. Instead, in case of the uh, gravitino, you can actually be all over the place in, in, in this case. Of course, the, uh, e, the way to disentangle the two would be to have a signal where the parameters look like uh, it's be already excluded by the direct detection, and this will already tell you that the neutralino you're seeing at collider is not really the dark matter. 
Now, the other important thing is the production of gravitinos. As we have seen, the production of gravitino is mostly dominated by the heat temperature and also by the spectrum of the particles and the gaginos in particular. And this one is actually uh, shown uh, in these plots where we, uh, first of all, these is the, uh, are the points which are already uh, more or less excluded by the present searches. And this one would be in the next, uh, the run at 14 TV with 300 inverse Fentobarn. So we see here, uh, we are plotting here the, um, yeah, the uh, logarithm of the uh, reheat temperature. Sorry, no, that's, yeah. It, as a function of the uh, mass of the NLSP. So the, in this case, is the, again, always the neutralino. And we see here clearly that the, um, well, we have already some constraints, but there are uh, actually also white regions at very small uh, neutralino mass. So therefore, that is a still uh, a possibility. And on the other hand, uh, in the future, we will be able to exclude uh, neutralino masses at least, well, depends how uh, well, but even in these dark blue regions, you exclude 80% of the points up to one TV, more or less, of the neutralino mass. Here, what I wanted to show you is that, in principle, you can have gravitino dark matter for any reheat temperature, as you see here. There are blue points all over the point. The uh, high reheat temperature uh, points are here, and they are actually uh, more easily tested by LHC, because in that region, in order to have high reheat temperature, you need low gaugino masses. If you remember the formula, it was proportional to the gaugino mass square and the reheat temperature. And on the other hand, you have also regions where the reheat temperature is very small, and in this region below here, actually, the superwind mechanism is instead playing a role in the production of gravitinos. And uh, due to this connection with the gravitino mass and uh, between the, the, the gravitino energy density and the gluino mass and the reheat temperature, we can actually say that the next LHC run will be able to probe this high reheat temperature region and possibly exclude reheat temperature of the order of 10 to the 9, 4, 10 to the 9, or something like that. So this one is the gluino mass, which will nominally be probably excluded in the next run, a little bit uh, below 2,000 uh, GeV. And uh, as I said, uh, these are the curves which give you the lowest gravitino mass, which is still compatible with the energy density uh, of the dark matter. OK, so let me go to the baryogenesis connection. Uh, the idea here is, of course, since we have our parity violation, then uh, the one idea could be also to try to do also baryogenesis with it. And actually, the idea was already a few years ago by Sandram Kui and uh, Kui later. And the idea would be to produce the baryon asymmetry through, in this case, the B-violating coupling, uh, R parity coupling, and the decay of a Bino, uh, which is freezing out in some after fr fr uh, he's uh, froze out. Uh, these are the diagrams which contribute to the CP asymmetry. And in order to have a non-vanishing CP asymmetry, you need usually a, a supersymmetric particle lighter than the Bino. In this case, it is the Gluino, which is uh, here. And you have practically to consider this scenario. In this scenario, you can very easily embed also gravitino dark matter through the same decay. And this is explained shortly here. The idea, of course, is that when you produce the baryon asymmetry uh, from the density, for example, of the Bino, you have a, a large suppression coming from the epsilon CP, which is a small number. In the case of dark matter production, you would uh, get a large suppression in the case of gravitino, especially because the branching fraction of decay into the gravitino is very small. And in this uh, scenario, it's not uh, difficult to get an epsilon CP of the same order of this branching fraction, so that in some sense you are able to explain the order of magnitude equality or, uh, if you want, the similarity between the density of baryons and density of dark matter just by assuming that this uh, branching fraction and epsilon are of the same order. Notice that at the end, this ratio is independent on the mother particle density, and uh, you just need to have, uh, in some sense, the right epsilon CP and the right... Uh, branching fraction. Unfortunately, this scenario is not as simple, and this is because there are also washout processes. If you look um, at things more in detail, as we are still doing, you get a lot of contribution and effects from washout uh, that actually moves uh, the scale, especially of the scalar particle, to quite a high scale of the order of 10 to the 7 GeV. So the scenario is still working, but you need larger masses of the scalar particle, larger masses of the Bino, uh, which is also beyond the LHC, if you want, uh, will ever probe. And in this scenario, we'll also uh, have the possibility to have the, the right dark matter density, but again, uh, due to the suppression through the large uh, scalar masses, you need also to push the gravitino mass high. 
So that is not surprising. So all the scales goes up, so it could also be natural to have a heavier gravitino. And you can go also to 1 TV or 3 TV uh, gravitino. In this case, the uh, one good news is that the gravitino lifetime is in the ballpark uh, what it will be tested by AMS, especially because in this case, the gravitino would decay also in antiprotons through the R parity violating coupling, which is also bio violating. Okay. Oh, I have zero seconds. <laughs> so I show just one plot on this. So uh, we will look also at this more, gen uh, this more simple scenario where you have just uh, two couplings and two masses uh, to parameterize actually this mother particle and daughter particle. So the, ma the dark matter here is psi and sigma is the particle which produces the dark matter. And in this case, you can have, of course, the decay of the dark matter again, and you have actually uh, a possibility to have both indirect detection and the production of dark matter in the right ballparks with coupling of the order of 10 to the minus 11 or so. And we tried to look at what are these are the, uh, the uh, prospects for uh, detection at collider. And what we found is, again, that is the same picture as with the stop. You could produce it and, in principle, have both displaced vertices and the metastable tracks. And there is still also room to have this double detraction, both in displaced vertices and metastable. Uh, but, of course, the, the indirect detection constraints, depending on the dark matter mass, are, in some sense, cutting off part of this region. If you would be in this region, you could be able, probably, to measure both couplings, the mass of the dark matter, and uh, possibly also the, well, the mass of sigma. So in that sense, the, in this case, that would be the uh, best case scenario where you could be able to reconstruct the full model. OK, so I am to have to finish. Uh, you can also explain the line, but I don't want to spend time on here. The line, in case of the line, you don't have displaced vertices, but prompt decay. And here I leave you my conclusion. Since I ran out of time, you can probably read it yourself. I hope I convince you that there are in some sense, alternative to the WIMP mechanism. Thank you. Time for a couple of questions. Yes. No. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, if supersymmetry will be discovered at LHC, what can you say about the mass of gravitina and how it is related to the vanishing cosmological constant if we uh, see this picture in the cosmological setting? Well, I mean, the gravitino mass is, in this case, scenarios is not directly measured at the LHC. So uh, in this case, you would measure only the NLSP. Only if you are able to also measure the decay, uh, the lifetime, and you are sure that is an R parity conserving case, then you would get a hint of the gravitino mass. Yeah, I'm, I do not mean the measuring. I mean the theoretical conclusion of discovery. What would it imply for gravitino mass? What are options? Uh, well, I mean, of course, as you all know, I mean, as you know, uh, it depends, of course, on the mediation mechanism, what is the size of the gravitino mass. And in this scenario, we are not looking at a particular scenario, I mean, a particular uh, mediation mechanism. We are using just the gravitino mass as a uh, free parameter. As you see from the plots, uh, usually we are looking more at GeV or 100 GeV uh, mass of the gravitino, which seems to be the, uh, the, the region where you can have higher heat temperature, which in some sense we like from the perspective of uh, cosmology in order to have also the leptogenesis or baryon asymmetry production. But in these scenarios, you could also live with smaller uh, gravitino mass as long as it is uh, heavier than 100 kV, so it is uh, sufficiently cold dark matter you would actually, uh, from cosmological perspective, uh, be fine. So you will need some mechanism of mediation which is compatible? Yes, yes. Thanks. OK, if there are no more questions, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you.